Hello, I'm Gerald Lewis. I'm a general physician and a cardiologist living in New Zealand, and this is another of my talks, medical talks on the web. <clears throat> and today's talk is why we need probiotics. It's very important for us to understand what's going on inside our intestines. In medicine, we tend to ignore this, and I think we ignore it to our peril, as you'll discover in the next 10 minutes. Now, to absorb food into our body, it must be broken down and then finally absorbed through these tiny little finger-like projections inside our small intestine. These are called villi. And when we eat food, first of all, it's munched up by our teeth. It's then exposed to enzymes in our saliva, our stomach, pancreatic juices, and bile, all of which help dissolve and break down the food. And then finally, we've got bacteria in the small and the large bowel, which do a large amount of our digestion for us. Now, the bacteria break down complex fats into simple fats. So complex fats break down into simple fats, triglycerides and simple fats. Complex sugar break down into simple sugars. And proteins, which look a little bit like that, these are the building product structures of our bodies, initially are broken down into what look like strings of beads, and then each bead is removed as amino acids, one, two, three, four, etc. Now, when you're born, the baby's gut is completely sterile, and the mother's breast milk, particularly the colostrum, inoculates the baby with good bacteria and yeast, which coats the baby's bowel. And these help with digestion and helps keep bad bugs away. The bacteria break down complex proteins into simple amino acids, which then come into our body, and we recognize those as we are babies, recognized by our, our immune tissue. Now, this is a microscopic view of the bowel with the little villa that you see there. And what we didn't know for a long time was what was the purpose of these splodges of lymphatic tissue, which are called payer's patches. And now we know exactly what happens. When a protein enters in through the bowel, goes through the villi, past the payer's patches, and the payer's patches look at it as it goes through and recognize it. And while we're babies, we have a look at these, and we see that these amino acids and small proteins are okay. So we, if we see them ever again, we're quite happy that these are okay, and we don't need to be worried about them. Now, our small intestine contains trillions of bacteria. It's been calculated. We've got more bacteria in our gut than the total number of people that have ever lived on the planet throughout the entire history. So there's a lot of them. And we've got good bacteria, which keep our bowel clean. They break down food. They help make both the B and the K vitamins. And they suppress the bad bacteria. And we've got bad bacteria, which damage the gut walls, cause infections, putrefaction, inflammation, flatulence, bad breath, and stop absorption. Really nasty looking things. Now, good bowel health is when you've got about 85% of good and less than 15% of bad bacteria. If we take antibiotics, it kills any bacteria. But it's not only exposed to antibiotics when you take pills and injections for infections, but our food, chicken, fish, meat, eggs, milk, all contains tiny little bits of antibiotic, which can affect our bowel. And also the junk food we eat, sweets and sugars, encourage the bad bacteria to grow in our bodies as well. Now, how important are these good bacteria? Well, here's an example. If you give antibiotics to a cow, it destroys the good bacteria. And if these aren't replaced, the cow can't break down grass food, the cow starves and dies. So farmers know that their animals need good bacteria, which they call probiotics, after they've had a course of antibiotics. Another good example is why we have an appendix, that little thing hanging from the cecum in the middle of our bowel, things that surgeons are very happy to chop off. Well, the appendix is a reservoir of good bacteria, and it's protected from diarrhea. Diarrhea tends to shoot past it without necessarily going down the appendix, and also antibiotics don't get into the appendix nearly so easily either. So back, good bacteria sit in the appendix, and then when the diarrhea and the antibiotics are finished, all the good bacteria zoom out of the appendix into the bowel and recolonizes it. Bad bacteria quite literally cause disease, dis-ease. E. coli, Salmonella, Clostridia, Staphylococcus aureus, are all present in most people's bowels, but they're usually kept under control. If they're allowed to grow unrestricted, they cause all sorts of bowel symptoms. E. coli, they cause diarrhea, urinary infections, typhoid, gastroenteritis, C. difficile, which happens quite frequently in hospital, causing diarrhea that's very difficult to control. Toxins, staphylococcus causes gastroenteritis. Bag bacteria produce molds and putrefaction, they stop food from being absorbed, they encourage parasites to thrive, and the bad bacteria attack the gut lining. And each of these has an important consequence, and we'll go through those one at a time. First of all, the mold and putrefaction releases toxins, so it causes diarrhea, bloating, bad breath, toxic feeling, feeling unwell, but more importantly, those toxins are absorbed into the body, and the liver's got to detoxify it. So it causes overload of the liver, and can cause depression, brain fog. 
the food is not absorbed and this leads to malnutrition with vitamins particularly being reduced causes diarrhea, weight loss, lack of energy. Parasites can thrive, causing thrush, yeast infections, urinary vaginal infections. Toxic bacteria also release things which make people feel worse. And finally, the bad bacteria can attack the gut lining. They actually attack the villi, making large holes in the villi. This is probably the most dangerous result of all because it produces something called leaky gut, which in actual fact is not like that, but basically the gut leaks on the inside, so large chunks of food can get into the bloodstream rather than only small ones. Leaky gut causes or aggravates many of today's diseases. Remember as babies, we learned what good and bad protein were because of these payers patches sitting in the wall of the intestines. Our bodies know these amino acids and these small proteins and they ignore them. But if a foreign protein comes into our body, we attack it. For example, a virus or a bacterium comes into our body. Our immune system produces antibodies and we attack the virus and bacterium and we kill it. Leaky gut allows larger proteins than normally should to get into our bloodstream. If that protein is similar to one of our body tissues, our immune system develops antibodies against these new proteins and attack them, and that causes allergies such as asthma, eczema sensitivities, but also is a major cause of immune diseases such as lupus, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, diabetes, etc., etc. Leaky gut causes and aggravates many allergies and many of today's immune diseases. It's very important. So bad bacteria cause major problems. So the answer, obviously, is to replace with good bacteria. We can cleanse the bowel and get rid of the bad. And good bacteria are bacteria which are found in healthy gut, and these are called probiotics. Probiotics basically means for life. Probiotics are healthy bacteria similar to those found in breastfed infants. Most come from two bacteria species, Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium, and they're found in some foods such as yogurt, fermented and unfermented milk, as long as it hasn't been pasteurized, miso, tempeh, and some juices and soy beverages. And also you can get probiotics in supplements, capsules, tablets, or powders. There's also things called prebiotics, which actually aren't bacteria at all. What they are are non-digestible foods that the probiotics can feed on. So who needs them and when we should take probiotics? We need to do when the bowel bacteria are causing symptoms with diarrhea, bloated, flagellants, irritable bowel syndrome, when you've been ill or under stress, during or after a course of antibiotics, after an overseas trip or while you're traveling, acute gastroenteritis and other conditions, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, any inflammatory bowel disease is made worse by bad bacteria, other immune diseases, lupus, asthma, multiple sclerosis, etc. After bowel surgery, urinary and vaginal infections, people with food allergies, eczema particularly in children, and old people, people living in hospitals, nursing homes, and people with immune, weakened immune system. A few questions which I'll go through rather rapidly, but you can slow this down and look at them one at a time if you wish. When should you take it? It depends on the coating used. Some you need to take with food, some after food, so basically read the label. Side effects are usually very few. Less than 1% of people have bloating, and if it happens, simply stop and restart again at a lower dose and after a few days. Can pregnant women take them? Yes. Can children take them? Yes. How fast will you see a change? Sometimes you get benefit after just a few days, but in other situations, remember these bacteria have got to multiply, so often it takes, what, two weeks, what, two weeks, maybe even longer to get the benefit. Can you take it with anti antibiotics? Absolutely, yes. Can you overdose on them? Absolutely, no. How long should I take them for? It's usually two or three weeks or until the symptoms have gone. How often do you need to take it? It depends. Some people suggest a burst of probiotics every few months. Can you do more than simply take probiotics? It's actually quite hard to retain the good bacteria in your bowel after you've been on probiotics. So it's good to take a course of top quality probiotics. Then after that, or even during that, eat regular yo yogurt, miso, etc. Reduce the high sugar, highly processed food in the diet so that the bad bacteria aren't encouraged. And eat regular prebiotics such as soluble fiber to feed the probiotics. Are probiotics all the same? No, they're not. Different strains of bacteria are more effective than others, and as you know, they've all got long, long names. Now, just like different cars have different benefits, well, different bacteria have different benefits as well. The best pro probiotics include Lactobacillus, Romanosus, and Bifidobacterium. Do you have those? You've got a good probiotic.
The other important thing is those probiotics must be able to get through into the bowel. Now, when you take a probiotic, it's got to go through the esophagus, through the stomach, through the duodenum, and out into the small intestine. It's got to pass through the very acid stomach juices, the very irritant gallbladder, the digestive pancreatic juices before finally getting through. So essentially, a probiotic must be acid, bile, and pancreatic juice tolerant, which is pretty hard to find. So usually people put a gel matrix around each bacterium, or they put them in enteric coated capsules, which don't dissolve until the capsule is passed through the pancreatic area. Now a good probiotic could make a huge difference to the health of virtually everybody. I believe everybody should take a course every three to six months. When you go overseas, take it as you travel and take it when you come home again with a course of antibiotics, whether it's oral or intravenous, with any form of bowel disturbance, allergies and immune diseases of any sort, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, thrush and other infections all benefit from probiotics. Take regularly yogurt and prebiotic fiber as well, but most importantly, make sure you take a good brand of probiotics to get all of these benefits. Thank you for listening.